Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Big Idea. I'm your host, Jason Seymour. I am the spokesperson for the U.S. Mission to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Thank you so much for joining us today. We started this show because we know that Southeast Asia is filled with leaders such as yourself. And we wanted to speak to one very special leader today. Our guest is Punjada Seri Vunabud. Welcome to the program, Puja, Punjada. Good morning, Jason and everyone. Good morning. I'm so glad that you have joined us. There are so many things that we can talk about today. But the first topic on my mind is the Fulbright program, because you are part of the Fulbright family. Please share with our audience a little bit about the Fulbright program, how you heard about it, how you got interested. Tell us a little bit of your story. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, well, first of all, I have to thank uh, Fulbright Thailand because they're the one that trying to encourage me to apply for Fulbright because I was studying in the US for so long. So then I, I was thinking that maybe I should go to some other regions in, in the world. So I went a lot to European University and then, you know, Fulbright, uh, Thailand, I have some colleagues there. So then um, she tried to convince me and then, then he told me that, um, you know, you should go to this ASEAN, uh, Fulbright, Fulbright ASEAN, because, you know, uh, you can also conduct the research in the US and at the same time, you can, you know, exchange all the culture, education, and some, so, uh, you know, uh, get a lot of new friends from the ASEAN country as well. So then that's why I, I apply for it. That's fantastic. Yes, the Fulbright program is an opportunity that gives researchers that time and those resources to dedicate to a research project. What was, what was the application process like for you? Well, uh, at first, you need to find a university in the U.S., you know, who are going to work, uh, you know, co-work with your research. So then I emailed some uh, universities that, you know, they, I know that there are some experts in the fields of uh, politics in Southeast Asia. And then I asking them whether they want to join my projects. So um, after that, you know, we start to develop the proposal together. Not, uh, not only me by myself, I need my colleagues in the US, the professor, um, you know, in the Northern Illinois University to help me on how to scope my research that fit the US, you know, benefit and at the same time sit, uh, fit the um, Thailand and Southeast Asia advantages. So then after that, we uh, go through the uh, proposal, I think more than like five or five or six times, you know, he keep changing, I keep changing all the contents. And then, you know, I got selected uh, for the interviews. Um, I was so happy at that time because mostly of, uh, you know, candidates, they are from science sections, right? They are like medical doctors, scientists, engineer. I think I was the only social science candidates that enter in that interview sections. And I was so surprised, you know, when I get into the uh, interview process, that's a lot of our um, diplomat from the US embassy in Thailand and some, uh, you know, scholar who got Fulbright before. So then they interviewed me about my projects and how my projects going to, you know, give an impact to the regions and in, enhance the relationship between Thailand, Thailand, ASEAN, and the US. So it basically, uh, most of the questions related to how we're gonna going to, you know, improve the uh, cooperation between the US and Southeast Asia, and especially the US and Thailand, something like that. So then mm -hmm. finally, I, I got selected uh, as the, um, you know, Fulbright for the US ASEAN um, scholar. Mm -hmm. I just want to emphasize a couple points that you made uh, regarding your application process. And one is to anyone interested in applying for this program, your proposal is not going to be written in one day. You're going mm -hmm. to think about it. You're going to rewrite it. It's very important. This is a very competitive process. So you really have to put time into that proposal. And number two, reach out to your mentors professors, other researchers, have them look at your proposal, uh, the, the, the parts of your application that they can help you on, you know, really, really lean into others because it, it is a competitive program and it's wonderful if you get it 
but you really have to put that energy into that application process. Yeah. One thing that I, I like about the ASEAN Fulbright uh, things, it's, um, you know, there's a spatial, I don't really remember exactly the program call, but it's an outreach. So then after you get uh, to be the Fulbrighter and then you went to the U.S., there's some funding for other community college in the U.S. or some other, you know, university can invite you to join their activities in the U.S. So then I, I got invited from the group of the community college in the U.S. I, uh, it's a consortium thing, you know, all the professor and teacher from the community college, they get together once a year and, you know, exchange their education and, you know, um, the econ uh, academic cooperations. So then they invited me and uh, another Fulbrighters from, I think from Korea to join that consortium. And then, you know, to exchange my views about Fulbright. And it's the same thing as I did it right now. I do it right now. So then they asked me uh, how to apply for Fulbright. Uh, is that difficult? How to develop my proposal? I think it's a great opportunity that, you know, I got a chance, I got a big chance to meet with the uh, community college people, which is when I was a student, I was in the university, so I did not really have a chance to meet with the another community professor or teacher, which is uh, they have a, some different focuses. And then I think it's a great opportunity to get to know them. And now I still in contact with some of them. When they came to Thailand, I, you know, show them around uh, my uh, university and show them around Bangkok. I think it's a really great opportunity. If you get Fulbright, I think you should try to apply for this outreach program as well. Uh, you, you have been interested in Southeast Asia for a long time. You studied in Ohio and Illinois. You've continued on as a researcher. You did the Fulbright program. What inspired you to want to study Southeast Asia in depth? Well, um, at first, actually, to be honest, I'm, I'm kind of a, uh, like to be in political scientists. At first, I want to do Latin American politics. And then, you know, after I talked to my professor and they um, and he, um, you know, advised me that um, if you do, if you do, uh, if I do the Latin American politics, when I finish my degree, it might be difficult to travel to Latin America from Thailand. So then he recommend me to maybe change my field to Southeast Asia because, you know, the political patterns of Southeast Asia is quite similar to some country in Latin American, uh, you know, states. So then that's why I switched to uh, Southeast Asia. And, you know, I expand my study not only for Thailand, but also to Philippines and Indonesia. And um, I think the politics of Thailand and some other ASEAN country are unique, you know, and they are uh, diff different from uh, other European countries or, you know, from the U.S. So then um, that's why I want to know more, like what, what exactly uh, are they like and how are they different? So then uh, in, in my PhD, I, uh, my focus is on comparative politics. So then I have to study more than one country. So I select Philippines, Indonesia, and Thailand. Mm -hmm. Fascinating countries. I just have to pause for a moment and talk about Latin America because I hope you do get to travel there. I've lived in multiple Latin American countries and done a lot of traveling. I hope you get the chance. Have you ever been? I did. I went to Peru and uh -huh. I really like it because it's a uh -huh. different, it's so beautiful, you know, and also um, yes. it's challenging. And I, uh, my friends uh, from middle school in the US, she worked a lot. Uh, she's a medical doctor and she went to the uh, Peru a lot, but then she inspired me that uh, you should go visit Peru. And I really, really like Peru. Mm -hmm. I hope that I do have a chance after COVID-19, you know, to go back to South America once again. I hope you do as well. So in terms of Southeast Asia, when, when was the first time that you learned that this entity called ASEAN uh, existed? Well, I think in, when I was, um, you know, in my undergrad in, uh, in uh -huh. uh, Jalalongkorn universities, that's a class about ASEAN, but at that time, no one knows about ASEAN. Um, you know, they, they uh, Thai student at that time, which is about almost 15 years ago, um, they did not really know what ASEAN is, and then they did not really know exactly what we are doing, uh, ASEAN's doing. 
So after that, you know, um, I, I heard the term, but I did not really know what, what, what is it until I continue my master's degree in Ohio University. So I took class on uh, international relations in Southeast Asia. So specifically, the, uh, my professor, you know, um, taught, taught us about what ASEAN, the roles of ASEAN, and how ASEAN impact this, um, you know, political stability in, in, uh, in each member state or, you know, what ASEAN exactly do how to build a cooperation with the big countries something like that and then when I continue my PhD I uh, select my second field as international relations so my first field is comparative politics and my second field is international relations that's another time that I studied a lot about international relations in Southeast Asia and ASEAN and also we study most about the relationship between ASEAN and some other you know um, regional cooperation and some other you know um other cooperation in the world so um that's why i'm i'm kind of interested interested in asean when i re study in my uh, master degree at ohio university mm -hmm. for the for the southeast asian listeners who are wondering about asean what would from your research what would be an example you would give where asean has had an effective impact, has made lives better for Southeast Asians? Well, um, about a couple of years ago, um, you know, um, as I mentioned, I was studying Indonesian politics as well, right? So then um, Thai government trying to set up an expert for ASEAN, each ASEAN members. So then I got selected as an expert in uh, Indonesian uh, politics. So I um, then they actually it's it's not my choice to do the um, you know the head, the research on the transboundary heads in Indonesia and how it's impact ASEAN that the um, the Thai government and the uh, the research fund that you know they want me to conduct this research on the transboundary heads and how it's affect ASEAN. So then um, then I studied about um, ASEAN and how it's uh, how the ASEAN trying to solve the problem of you know pollutions and environmental uh, crime, something like that. So I think so far, you know, um, I think it's better than maybe I would say like five years ago. Now we don't, we don't really see the haze from Indonesia going to Thailand, but it's still going on in Indonesia. So then I think ASEAN play a role better than before, but still, you know, they still need more power, more, uh, you know, um, rest, uh, activity to trying to do something and trying to, force, uh, you know, not, not kind of force, but trying to make ASEAN state to get together and solve some other problem together. At this time, uh, at this at this moment, sometimes ASEAN, you know, member state, they have their own policy and it's kind of really difficult for all of them to get together, trying to get the consensus on any policy related to politics, socials, and, you know, uh, security. So I think if they're more, kind of a power or something that ASEAN can get together, make the policy together. I think ASEAN will be more power and you know, increase their roles in the um, international politics. I would have follow-up questions, but I wanna pause for a moment and take a question from our audience. Thank you, Casper Foon for offering a question. Casper is from Taiwan. He wants to know if you have a take on the Milk Tea Alliance. <laughs> yeah, um, actually, um, now I'm in, I'm, I'm in Singapore at ICS, you still be checks us, um, actually the name, the name of my office is just uh, right here in the background. Um, I did a lot of our Chata, research. If I, Chata, if I may pause you for a moment, in your answer, if you could please explain for our audience what the Milk Tea Alliance is, because not everyone in the audience knows. Okay, uh, Multi Alliance is actually is about the protest among the young generation. It started from you know um, Hong Kong and you know the young generation from Hong Kong, and they get together trying to protest against the government. And you know Multi because the young generation they drink a lot of Multi, right? So then they set up uh, the um the, the kind of group to protest against the government. Uh, last year, last year, you know the young generations of Thailand sort of a get together trying to protest against the, uh, the pro-military, you know, political party as well. And they seem to link to, together, you know, from one country to another through the social media. And, um, you know, um, 
at that time, the multi alliance in Thailand kind of uh, really famous. And then, you know, the young generation used this technique to get together. But this year, uh, in Thailand itself, uh, there's no, uh, then I don't think, I, I don't see any, um, you know, um, relationship and they don't really connect it with other young generation from other country as well. So basically the multi is about the young generation in different country, you know, and also in Thailand trying to protest against the uh, government. So far, you know, um, that's a lot of going on. If I'm, if I'm going to talk about this, it might take like uh, another half an hour. But so far at, uh, at this time, I think it's really difficult for the young generations to make change in Thailand because there are some, a lot of obstacle, you know, uh, the courts just rules about, you know, um, uh, about the, uh, the protests uh, last week. And I'm not going into, uh, gonna go into details. And I think it's really difficult for the young generation to make move, to make change for the top politic at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, have you seen them, would you say they've made any change? Uh, for the young generation? Yeah, do you think the young generation and the Milk Tea Alliance and the various protests, do you think that they have made any impact? Well, one thing they make people, you know, especially the young generations, to be alert about politics. In my year, you know, when I was uh, my, in my teenager, we don't really care about politics. At, at that time, there's a lot of uh, protests, there's, a, uh, there's some uh, military coup, there's some government corruption problem, but because of the lack of the social media, we, do, we did not really know what's going on in Thai politics. But at this time, you know, because of the power of social media, the young generations, you know, they learned a lot about what's going on in politics of Thailand. So I think the, the most important impact at, uh, from this young generation protest in the last couple of years, they make people to alert more, get to know more about what's going on in politics. One thing that I want to give an example, uh, when I first started my political class in Mahidol University, which is about um, seven years ago, um, I did not really, I had, a, I had a difficult time to find a student at Mahidon and I have to give a background, Mahidon is a science university, so most of our students are medical doctor, engineer, scientists, so they did not, they are not really cares about politics at that time, seven years ago. I did not have a large number of students at, uh, you know, register for my class, but in the last five years, a large number of students register for my class. And, you know, half of them are from medical school, scientists, and Mahidon uh, control a lot of uh, medical schools. So then um, maybe like uh, four or five medical school, you know, they, uh, they join Mahidon for their first year or, you know, their first two years, something like that. So they register for my class and they are active. They know everything. They raise questions, which I did not really expect that they're going to ask these kind of questions. Uh, this semester, um, you know, I can accept only 60 students in my class, right? I got like more than um, 20, 30 emails asking me to add more students in the class. And they asked me, you know, can you um, tell us the stories about um, the post, uh, you know, the previous protests, political protests in Thailand, can you tell us what's going on about the constitutions? These kind of questions, you know, if you go back seven years ago, I don't think that student gonna ask it. But after the coup, you know, um, uh, the 2014 coup in Thailand, I think it's made change a lot. And, you know, it's made how the young generation change on their thinking about politics. I think it's really interesting. So. I think the more young generations knows about politics and they need change, one day it will be real change, which I don't really know exactly when, but it will take some time, you know, to make Thailand change by the power of the young people. I, I just want to comment on what you were saying. If any of Punchada's students are listening to this program, or whether you're listening live right now or you found it later, put some stories in the comments below. Yeah. Tell us about how Punchada is as a, a lecturer. I just wanna quickly remind all of our listeners that the Fulbright US ASEAN call for applications 
is still open. So if you are interested, please check out bit.ly slash Fulbright US ASEAN for more information. And we'll have that link in the description below. Uh, Punchada, do you, do you, people have been turning to social media. Many young people have turned to social media to express themselves or design gatherings. What are the trends you're seeing in terms of governments enabling young people to have conversations online? Do you think that they're becoming more open or are they becoming more restrictive? They are going to be more restrictive <laughs> because, um, well, uh, students start to criticize a lot uh, about politics about the uh, palace, you know, about, um, you know, the regulation constitution, which is, um, you know, we did not really see this kind of thing happen before. So the government issues a couple laws in, you know, in the last uh, three or four, four, three years, you know, trying to um, warning some, um, you know, student or some netizen who try to criticize the government or criticize the, um, you know, uh, the elites in Thailand. So then I think it's more restrictions, but the more restriction, the more people want to use online as a, you know, space yeah. that they can, yeah, to fight back. Mm -hmm. Now it's not only the young generations, the old generations, you know, who are not really grow with the social media, start to use the uh, internet, start, start to use social media to contact with the young generation more. Well, um, if you guys know about Thailand, there's a um, prime minister who were, uh, who was who's from, uh, was kicked out from Thailand like almost 20, uh, almost 20 years, I think uh, 10 years, yeah. So um, Thaksin Chinawat, he used the um, social media to contact the young generations. Maybe, maybe you heard about Clubhouse, right? Or, and also YouTube. Um, he used Clubhouse a lot to uh, communicate with the young generations to, you know, teach them, um, you know, what was uh, what he did in the past that make Thailand uh, more successful in economics and, you know, increase the um, popularity of Thailand at the international level. So not only the young generations, but now uh, older generation use social media to contact with the young generation as well. Now you spent a lot of time in your teenage years and then in your 20s living, researching in the United States. Yeah. How do you feel? Obviously the culture, Southeast Asian cultures and the and US culture have similarities, have some differences. How do you think spending so much time in the United States affected you and how you perceive Southeast Asia, how you perceive the world, how you perceive yourself? Well, let me tell you this. Um, I live uh, in the city, Dikau, which is near Chicago. But in uh, my last, when I wrote my dissertations, I moved to Chicago. I love Chicago so much. I think it's my second home. I, mm -hmm. uh, before COVID-19, I, I went back to Chicago every mm -hmm. year, every year, just to visit friends and, you know, to see some old things that happened to me in the last 10 years in the U.S. Well, um, that's a lot of... Uh, uh, differences between Thailand and Southeast Asia and also to the U.S. When I was young, I uh, when I was um, maybe like 12, um, I went to study uh, in the middle school in um, Greensboro, uh, North Carolina. It was the first time that I got culture shock because there are so many differences um, between Thai school and the U.S. school. First of all, in the U.S., there's a lot of diversity. You can have friends from, you know, um, Americans, Asia, African American, Latin American in your class. And there's so many friends and some of friends I'm still in contact. Can you believe it or not? And we still um, texting, we still uh, see each other when I went to the US. And, um, you know, in Thailand, there's so many Thai. Uh, in the class, we, um, we don't have mixing diversity in class. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is the, um, the way you, you study in class. Um, in the US, it's more like seminar. You have to talk a lot. You raise your hand when you have questions. You have to be brave to express your ideas, ask the question from the professors. But in Thailand, it's different. 
um, if you raise your hand, someone would say that you want to show out or, you know, um, sometimes you have to respect, um, you know, your teacher. If you ask question and if your teacher was wrong, it might be a threat to you in the, in the whole semester. But in the U.S., if you have question, you just ask. So then that's why it's made me change. You know, I'm kind of very brave to, to, to give a talk or ask question in public because of the U.S. education. And um, another interesting thing is the, um, the prom night in the U.S. Um, I think it's really culture shock to me because in, in Asia, you know, you have to be really just, um, you know, uh, when we have the um, what's commencement ceremony or, you know, the end of your high school, it's just like a small party get together. But mm. in the U.S., the prom is a, it's a big thing, you know. Yeah, and I, I remember that. I, I, I was exciting. I did not really know. I saw my friends, um, you know, went out for that. I think it's really different from, from my life in, in Bangkok and in Thailand. Mm. And when you go through the uh, master degree, PhD, it's totally different from the education in Thailand. Our seminar is um, classes. It's the major class in uh, study in the US in the grad school, right? But um, when I came back to teach in uh, Mahidon University in Thailand, when you try to do the seminar, students um, were upset. They did not really want to talk to me. They prefer lecture. And if you give too much lecture, you did not really give students to think, to have analytical thinking, right? They just mm -hmm. listen to you, which, which is different from the US. So then that's why, you know, um, the education from the U.S. make me change a lot, make me change my perspective about education, about academic, about how to do research, which um, I think I, I have a great opportunity. I have to thank my parents, you know, to, to trying to support me to study in the U.S. for the whole thing of my uh, PhD. And also I have to thank my um, I have a family in the U.S. I call them as my American parents, American dad and American mom. They, they always cheer me up to study, you know, in the U.S. as well. Mm. It, it's, it's quite <laughs> difficult, yeah. <laughs> Lovely that you still have all those wonderful ties. Casper added a comment saying that Asians are shy. Yeah. And I, I don't know if Asians are more shy than Americans, but you are correct that in the educational system in the United States, particularly in the social science, political science, uh, international relations, you have to speak up or yeah. you will not be successful. The professors do expect you to engage, to ask questions, to respond to questions, use those analytical skills that you mentioned. That is definitely part of the, the academic structure. And I know many Asian students, when they first transfer to the United States for an experience, that that is a bit challenging for some of them to get out of that comfort zone. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you were so successful. And so back to ASEAN, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about ASEAN Recently, ASEAN has been forward with the five consensus plan. I don't know if you're familiar with that plan in terms of Burma, Myanmar. I don't know if you've had any thoughts about that or you have been doing any research uh, regarding ASEAN and security and Myanmar. Did you have any thoughts on that you'd like to share? Yeah, um, actually, um, I did not really do the research about this and uh, uh, Myanmar a lot. But uh, one thing that I, um, I, I, I think is, so, you know, um, ASEAN has a strong, you know, uh, culture, like, you know, the non-interference thing. And then, you know, if anything happened in one country um, and it's internet, if, if it's internal affair, other member states should not intervene in the internal affairs. But I think if, if it's, um, you know, cross the line to be more like violations of human rights and, you know, more conflicts and more violence in the country, I think maybe ASEAN need to step a little bit and think about that um, if, if um, anything happened in their member state and it's violate the human rights, I think ASEAN is supposed to step in and try to solve that problem. Because, you know, for me, um, human right is a big thing. You cannot just, um, you know, threat people by using force or by using arm. I think it's an important thing that um, 
you know, the ASEAN state have to think about this and trying to do something to prevent the violence or, you know, any violations against humanities. I'm sure in your studies, as you've looked at what has happened in Southeast Asia, sometimes you probably feel optimistic and hopeful. You see signs that things are getting better. Then sometimes maybe you're, you're not as optimistic and you are concerned about certain trends. How do you stay focused? How do you stay driven and positive and keep doing what you're doing? This is something that a lot of Southeast Asian leaders have to, they have to find that inspiration within to keep going and keep fighting for the causes that they believe in. What are your words of inspiration? Well, uh, first of all, you know, um, when I'm, I'm kind of, if I want to do something, I always trying to, to complete and success it. So um, first thing that I look at um, people who success in what I want to do, I look at how they did it, um, you know, for example, like the Fulbright applications. So I look at the, um, you know, the website of the alumni. <laughs> yeah, so then I look at how they did it and, you know, what kind of uh, projects that um, should be possible to get the funding from Fulbright. So then some website uh, in Thailand as well. So then you can look at the list of the successful candidates, right? So then I look at how they did it. And then I follow, you know, um, the way they did it. Luckily enough, some of the uh, successful candidates um, are my friends. So then I ask them how to develop the proposal, how to connect with the university in the U.S. You know, connecting with the professor in the U.S. is not, is not easy. You have mm -hmm. to really have the same focus. Then they did not really accept you if you did not share the same focus. So then I, I have to have to find that professor. And then I finally did it. I found I found that person. So then um, and then I, I work hard. I, you know, um, I trying to focus. And then I think every step, every energy that we invest in our work, uh, we have to really do it because if you want a success, um, you know, you have to push your energy and then trying to do the best. Um, my parents told me once, you know, uh, during my PhD um, education, I was about to quit many times because it was tough, you know, in the US it's really tough. And when my friends called me from Bangkok, they were partying and then I was in the library. So I feel <laughs> upset, you know. So then my parents told me that if you fail one time, it's going to be your excuse to fail the next time and the other times. So then you have to keep working to get it success. And then you're not going to be, to feel like you, you, um, you know, you, you, you're not going to feel sorry that you did not really do it. So then every time I, 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 I did stuff, I always trying to focus and trying to do my best to um, complete and success. It. That's great advice. I, I agree with you. Sometimes when I need motivation, I look at, uh, I look at the resumes of Fulbrighters or look at some of the members of the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative and all the amazing things that they're doing throughout Southeast Asia. And I, I perk up. Do you, do you have any specific role models from the United States that you are inspired by? I would say Tammy Duckworth, she is a Thai, right? Yeah, she went to the same university as me and she has the same advisor as me, but she did not really finish it. I think she, she got master, but I, I heard her a lot of her story from my professor and uh, my professor now, um, he passed away. And um, I heard about her story when she went to the war in Iraq and then, you know, what an accident she got. So I, I think I'm, I'm so proud of her because she's kind of, she, she's high too. And then um, she can be at this position. I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, she's like my role model. And then I look at how her work, I listen to her story <laughs> from my uh, advisor and a lot of uh, my colleagues in, in uh, uh, Northern mm -hmm. Illinois University. Uh, they talk a lot about, uh, we call it P-Tammy, like, uh, in P is mean sister in Thai, we call everyone who order as P, right? Uh, about mm -hmm. Tammy uh, that word. And I, I think she's the one that uh, inspired me a lot, not only about education, about life, but about how to enter politics as well. 
She has a very special story and she is the current senator from Illinois. So yeah. uh, wonderful to have her as a role model. Do you have any Southeast Asian role models? Well, um, maybe maybe Thai, <laughs> maybe Thai. Yeah. Actually, I uh -huh. like Tongori as well, you know. But um, maybe I should focus all, more on Thai. I like um the current um, what um the former prime ministers of Thailand, Kun um Chuan Li Pai. He maybe in the you know as a as the uh, politician, maybe a lot of people don't like him, but. As a person who give you an advice about how to to do life, to work, how to understand life, I think he's the one that um, giving me a lot of uh, um, you know knowledge and you know comments about how to work, how to be success, how to focus on your work. He's I think I uh, he's the one that uh, my role model in in my career. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, as I always tell people at any age. It's important to find people who inspire you, role models, as you said, and also we need to find great mentors. And so I just wanna remind our audience about what I mentioned before, the Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative. If you are Southeast Asian and you're between the ages of 18 to 35, and you are not already a member of the Waisili Network, what are you waiting for? The, we'll have the information in the description below, but this is a great opportunity, not only to find programs and hear about things that the US government, uh, opportunities the US government offers to you, but it's a way to find mentors and other young leaders such as yourself. And we will help you find mentors because they just make such a big difference in their life. Well, Punchala, I want to thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. I've had such a good time. I want to give you an opportunity to say any last words for advice for the audience, uh, any, any last bit of information you want to share before we end this interview. Well, I would say it's about Fulbright. Um, you know, um, Applying for Fulbright, it's um, a lot of opportunity, opportunity uh, you know, are waiting for you if you get selected and you, uh, you know, you went to do research. And when you become Fulbrighters, I think it's the great title to be recognized mm -hmm. at, um, you know, every, every, around the world, everyone know Fulbright. So then mm -hmm. let's apply and then I, I wish you all luck if you want to apply and, you know, to go to the US with this Fulbright. Yeah. It's a great experience that always stays with you, no matter where you go. And as you said, everyone knows the Fulbright, well, most people know about the Fulbright <laughs> program. We try to make sure that everyone knows about it. We, we keep spreading the word. And then you join a family of alumni who, ha who had the opportunity to be part of the program. Well, again, thank you so much, Punchada. I look forward to the day when I can visit you in Singapore or Thailand and we can meet in person and have some milk tea together. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that day. All right, thank you so much. And thank you to our audience for joining us for another great episode of The Big Idea. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much.